I came kind of in the middle of the, um, of the dating thing there, um, and uh, I, I didn't manage to get a date, but I met some, met some nice people, but I'm pretty sure, I, I hope that, that there will be at least one marriage coming out of this. Uh, or, or maybe not marriage, but you know, maybe a hookup. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> it looked very intense. <clears throat> All right, so 10 years ago, pretty much uh, exactly, it was in April, I created Cucumber, and I was already four years into my BDD journey at that point. Um, and over the years, I've learned to use this tool that I created, which I didn't really invent. Um, I just improved on, on other things uh, that other people had done. My, the way that I use the tool and the way that I practice BDD has changed gradually over time. But there was a moment when it changed significantly, and that was when Matt Wynn, um, my colleague, he's here, introduced me to example mapping. Um, so I'm going to show you quickly some of the I'll demo example mapping uh, soon, but I'm sure before I do that, I, I'd like to illustrate some of the typical problems that example mapping can help you overcome. And these are very typical problems that people often have when they use Cucumber. So the first one is feature files that look like this. They are typically written as an afterthought. Uh, it's probably written by somebody who used to be a manual tester. It's got loads and loads of technical details in it. Um, very, you know, big tables, um, referring to UI elements, referring to some strange IDs, maybe a bit of XML and some JSON. You get some CSS in there, that's really cool as well. Um, sometimes you'll find, you know, monsters and stuff, but there's all these weird things and it's just this incoherent rambling, which essentially is just reflecting how, the, what the user interface is like. Right. Um, and the people, the testers who write these kind of tests, they, you know, after a while they start to wonder, you know, maybe it's a bit hard for other people to understand what this means. I understand it, you know, it gives me confidence that the software is working. But I've also heard that behavior-driven development is supposed to be about communication, you know, bringing in the business. Uh, oops, there's a hole behind here. <laughs> <laughs> bringing in the business um, and, and developers and so on. And the developers, they're, tr they're trying to, you know, they're doing their best and they're looking at these feature files and, and then they don't really like it, you know, it's just, ah, these tests are just too slow, I don't really, um, they never, you know, they're, they're flickering, they never pass, sometimes they're red, sometimes they're green. It's just too much coupling to the technology here. And the product owner is, you know, who you're supposed to get some feedback from, they're just throwing their hands up in the air and, and they go, I have no idea what you're talking about in this Gherkin document. Um, and that's why, you know, it's when, when you write Gherkin scenarios as an afterthought, after the sof software has been written, just basically reflecting what the user interface does, that's when you end up in this kind of situation. So example mapping can help with that. Another very common problem is that you start out on a project, or maybe you start on a sprint, and there's something new to develop, and you have your user stories, and people, you know, they they talk about them, they read what it says in the, in the ticket, and everybody's got some, you know, slightly different understanding of what we're supposed to build. The problem is that they don't know they have a different understanding. So people discover quite late, sometimes they discover it mid-sprint, sometimes they discover it after the third sprint, sometimes you don't really realize you've got a completely different understanding of what to build until stuff is in production. So what we really want to get to is, is this scenario, oops, is this you know, imaginary state where everybody has the same understanding of what to build. So how do you get there? Well, one of the problems is that there's too many handoffs in software development in many teams. You've got product owners who, you know, they put the story into some issue tracker, and some developer, they, you know, they pull it off of that uh, issue tracker. I'm not intentionally not mentioning the issue tracker, but you know which one I mean. I mean, it doesn't really matter which one I mean. Um, they're all the same. Um, the, the problem here is that there's no conversation happening between the product owner and, and the developer. So the whole development 
process is a little bit like Chinese whispers. You know, every time there's a handoff, um, the understanding changes a little bit. And, and the developers, they, they, you know, they ship buggy software because they haven't really understood the requirements. And the QA, you know, they throw bugs back. And then you, you've got this really, really frustrating and not very efficient way to deliver software. It's really, really frustrating. So people read about BDD, and they go to conferences, and they hear about things like uh, Three Amigos. That sounds like a good idea. Maybe we should talk to one another before we develop the software. People realizing that exchanging information in the form of, of documents isn't the best way to exchange information. You, it's really hard for me, if I'm writing a document, giving it to you, to, to verify that you've understood what I mean if I, if I can't you know, ask you questions to verify that you've understood what I meant. You don't have that feedback loop in the document. Um, but, but you can do that when you put people together and they can have a conversation. Um, so people started doing Three Amigos, but they quickly had this problem that you know, they, they booked a meeting and they brought a story in and they were like, Not quite sure how to have this conversation. I don't really know where to start. So lots of people have been trying to do three amigos, but lacking a structure to do it, they haven't really seen the benefits that other people have seen. So example mapping is a technique that will help you put some structure around your three amigos meetings. Some people call them discovery workshops. It doesn't really matter what you call them. But the purpose of, um, well, there are many purposes of an example mapping session. So I'm going to show you how it works, and then I'll talk a little bit about what kind of benefits it brings. OK, so I've got this very original setup here. Can you see this? Can you see my hand? You can't see my hand. See? It's magic. But that's just because I need to sometimes wake it up. All right, can you see now? Yeah, great. <laughs> so let's take these away. So imagine that you're working for a train company. <coughs> we could make all sorts of jokes about SNCF, if you know about SNCF. Some people managed to get here despite those problems. <laughs> Good to see you, Bruno. Um, this is an exercise that, um, that was originally introduced by uh, Emily Bates. She's used that as a carter to, to practice um, programming, but it's also a great little case to illustrate example mapping. So we're working for a, um, a train company, and we're going to make a new website where people can book tickets. So you imagine that the train company, they expose a feed of, of trains and booking, and we're going to make a better booking experience using that feed. Okay. So we've got a user story that um, it sits on a backlog, and it's probably one of the first user stories, and it's, you know, book seats. So the three amigos, or four amigos, or five amigos, it could, you know, it could, be, it could be a product owner, business analyst, developer, tester, UX designer, security expert, you name it. The point is that you take a, a diverse group of people who all have a different perspective on how software needs to be built, Users are great to put in this meeting. You put them in the same room, you spend 25 minutes, and you do what I'm about to show you. So you start with a story. Um, and that's for yellow cards. And you've got three other colored cards um, that you use for this technique. The second kind of cards that you use is uh, the blue cards. So for this particular story, there are two business rules or acceptance criteria that the product owner knows about that he's explaining or she's explaining to, to the team. One is that we shouldn't fill up more than 70% of the seats in the train. And this is to allow people to just walk onto the train without having to make a booking. Okay? <laughs> is that funny? <laughs> oh, lunch. <laughs> Go away. Lunch. Oh, uh, right, OK. Uh, notifications, do not disturb. Right. And I think this one fell asleep again. Right, there we go. Oh, it's actually from my phone. It's really confusing. Right, OK. 
<laughs> if this one like st starts acting up again, uh, I'll, you know, you can just keep laughing. I'll know that something is wrong. Um, and then there's another rule. Um, well, let's just we'll get to the other rule. Once we have a rule, which is the blue cards, we use green cards to come up with examples to illustrate those rules. Okay. So we'll place that underneath. So here is a concrete example that illustrates this rule. <laughs> this, can be, this can become really funny. I think we've barely seen the beginning of this. <laughs> so, so we've got this example here that illustrates this rule. Um, I imagine there's, a, there's, a, there's a, uh, a train with two coaches, and in one coach, the one coach is fully booked, and the other one's got one seat booked, and then somebody would like to book three seats. So what we expect to see here is that those three seats get booked. So it's, it's an example that illustrates the rule. It broadens our understanding about the rule. But it can also be turned into a, a test later on. And then we've got another one, which is uh, a, a sad path. You know, here somebody wants to book four seats. They can't because that would mean booking 15 out of 20 seats, which is more than 70%. So they shouldn't get a seat. So we're doing two things here. We're broadening our understanding by illustrating the rules with concrete examples, and we're also designing tests. Now, one thing that's worthwhile mentioning here is that I don't have any mention of technical details here. You know, you can imagine it's 1922. There are no computers. People had trains back in 1922. Um, I'm describing business rules, and this is essential. You want to remove everything that has to do with implementation detail here, because you're not describing a solution, you're describing business rules um, in order to broaden the understanding and, and design tests to test their implementation. Now, when somebody comes up with this example, um, somebody might ask, well, you know, it's a bit of a shame that this person can't book, or they've wasted time on the website now, should we, should we spend, should we, should we tell them how, much, how many seats are bookable in advance? So you can write that up as a question. So people write up questions during the example mapping session. Here's another rule. Um, all seats over booking needs to be in the same coach. We don't want to split families. So one example here is that we've got these two um, coaches, one with five and one with one. Um, and somebody wants to book six. Well, we put them in this coach, not this coach. Right, because if we put them here, that would, that would split them. Here we've got another example, another sad path. What if you want to book nine here? You know, there's just two and two. Um, there, is no, there is no room for, no, we would have to split a family if we let them book uh, nine seats. So that brings up another question. Well, okay, we could have fit them in, perhaps, if we had filled up the coaches differently. You know, if, we, if we'd filled up all of those four in that coach, we would have been able to fit them in, in the other one. So that brings up a new question. How do we fill up coaches when the train is empty? And you keep going like this, and then when you spend 25 minutes, and when you're done, uh, you have an understanding of um, how big the story is. So, you know, sometimes, um, uh, sometimes you'll end up, end up with loads of rules, so maybe somebody will come up with um, an answer to these questions, maybe in, in a later meeting or maybe in the same meeting. So instead of having this, maybe we'll have this. You know, a bunch of more rules. Well, now you can use the, the visual layout of the rule to, to make an easy assessment whether the, the story is too big. So it becomes easy to split the stories. You can say, okay, these two blue cards here, they are just going to become rules that we're going to do in a later uh, sprint. So. To summarize, <coughs> example mapping is something you do at the beginning of the project. It's in your discovery phase. And if you do this well, you will write much better Gherkin, because they're based on a shared understanding of the problem domain. And you will also be much better at automating these and doing test-driven development based on stuff that isn't related to the UI. You build empathy by doing this, because everybody has a chance to give the best shot. It's much harder to point the finger when you're done. 
You bring up questions, so, which means you don't have to start working on stuff that isn't ready to get start working on. So you get that early feedback that you're not ready, which is great. You get examples for tests, smaller stories, and you get a shared understanding. That's example mapping in a nutshell.